Time's been tough lately here in Gallo Springs, but ain't they always? There's a glimmer in the dark known as Miss B's Haven, the local saloon. Its doors just swung wide open after recent renovations. It's a warm spot in a cold world, filled with folks who've got tales to tell and skills you might need to call on. Ears to the ground, you picked up some fresh leads at the bank, the stables, and the trading post too. You've even heard that the town hall's now open to the public. Faced with a wealth of new opportunities, you pull out your to-do list, etch down 10 tasks, and aim to see them done. Now tread lightly, but carry a firm resolve. In this close-knit patch of dirt, you've carved out a place for yourself as a leader who pulls strings without being seen, a shadow governor. All right, weary travelers, looks like you're settled in now and ready for your first advanced game mode, Shadow Governor. If you aren't acquainted just yet, make sure you see the first tutorial on warm welcome before diving into this one. For the setup of all game modes, refer to side B of the matching game mode card. Okay, we're gonna explain what's new as we're setting up Shadow Governors. Also notice that all components tied to a store will have the store's icon listed on it, like riders being tied to the saloon. The goal of Shadow Governors is to score 10 notoriety points. You're gonna track the notoriety you earn using a cube on the notoriety track on your player board. When you gain notoriety, move the notoriety cube along the notoriety track on your player board equal to the number of stars that have been earned. If a notoriety point that has already been earned is lost for any reason, you will lose that notoriety and move your notoriety cube back an amount equal to the number of points that have been lost. If a game is ever played beyond 10 notoriety, bring the notoriety cube back to the first space on the track and use the milestones track to mark how many times you've already passed 10 notoriety. Now that you're playing an advanced game mode, all notoriety icons that display advanced are up for grabs and the possibilities are nearly endless. Before, we all had the same intro to-do list. Now, we put the intro to-do list away and deal one left page and one right page of the very to-do list randomly to each player. Together, these two pages display an adjective and a noun that give your character an identity for this game like the wise city slicker. Whenever you accomplish a task listed on either of the to-do lists, you immediately place one of your 10 checkmark tokens on its notoriety icon and advance the notoriety track on your player board. Next up, we have Mirth's mount, which you can also turn to side B. Only once you already own a mount, Mirth now offers an option to pay $3 to find and purchase your mount's matching saddle as a no-grid action. Now keep in mind that you can only buy the saddle that matches your horse. You place the saddle token on your horse and it gives you plus one speed immediately, which you can adjust on your player board. If you ever lose a PvP fight and the winner chooses to loot your mount, they must pass the persuasion check shown on the top left of the mount card. Then the mount's original owner gets to keep or discard anything that was stored on it before giving the mount card and the saddle token over to the looting player. A saddle can't be looted by itself, but a saddle with a horse can be looted together. As shown in the game mode card, the saloon will not be turned over to side B. Now you can recruit riders. There are now three rider slots displayed on the saloon tile. Separate each rider token by the type listed at the top of the token, skills, storage, and bargains, and shuffle and stack them separately with the perk sides facing up. Take each of these three stacks and place them in their respective slots. As a no grid action while in the saloon, you can spend $5 or discard four hide to recruit a rider. Now keep in mind, whenever you're choosing from a face up stack of cards or tokens, you may only take the one that's visible on top. Okay, so once you pay and recruit, place that chosen rider on your player board and gain one NP. You'll now have that rider's perk as long as that rider's token is on your board. As you can see along the top of the rider ticket, a novice hunter can only have one rider at a time, while a journeyman can have two and a master can have three. So you'll need to make sure you're leveling up your endeavors, in this specific case is for hunting, in order to unlock these additional slots. A skill perk means that you can increase the skill by the amount listed, so if it reads plus one agility, you can increase your agility by one. A bargain rider increases the selling price of one type of resource, and a storage rider gives you one more slot available to hold a resource. In combat, if you defeat a player who currently has a rider and chose the rider loot option, you must pass the persuasion check listed on their rider. If successful, you can take a rider token from their player board and place it on an open slot on your player board. You gain the notoriety points and the rider's perk, 
while they lose the notoriety and the perk. Master Hunters also gain the search perk, which allows you to look through the face-up stacks before making a purchase. This applies to any face-up stack, not just riders. Now, aside from riders, you can also mount heads in the saloon as another no grit action. You place predators on the wooden plaques, and then bandits and cultists will go on the wanted posters. And then you'll gain the notoriety points shown, as well as the sale price listed on the right side of the token. Once heads are placed there, they'll remain in those slots for the rest of the game. That means these notoriety are first come, first serve. Moving on to the next shop, Gatman Gunsmith has the same setup as before. Side A with six weapons face up and the weapons deck placed here. That tile is not flipped to side B until you progress to the final advanced game mode, Masters of Chaos. In Reader Shop, you're gonna flip her tile to side B and place the new Hunter Skill cards shuffled on the right side. As a no grit action, you can gain these combat cards by trading in a head or discard four hides. Now, unlike face up stacks, anytime you purchase something from a face down stack of tokens or cards, you can always draw two, choose one to purchase, and then sweep the other to the bottom of the deck. When you gain these, they go straight into your combat deck. You can also sell heads to Rita, which will earn you both the sell price listed on the right side of the token, as well as a hunter's skill card. Token sold to Rita will always be returned to the supply. Next up, you can place a brand new store tile below the town tile. This is the town hall, also known as Gala Hall, and make sure side A is facing up. Now you can interact with the mayor of Gala Springs, Francis Gallo III. During setup, you'll place one of the calendar tokens on the birthday month of the first player's character. Now you'll see this listed on the actual character card. And a second one on 276 AH, both of them with size X facing up. That's the month in which the game is going to begin. All right, notice how the calendar has certain resources marked in each row. This means that during that time, the resource shown is in season and its buy and sell prices are both increased by $1. During the final step of each night phase, which is called advanced calendar, the month marker advances by one month. When the month marker rotates back to March, the year marker moves to the next year. The reason why is because March 1st is their new year on Bantam. If the calendar token lands on the gunsmith restock icon, then you draw six cards from the weapon rack and randomly place them face up on the top of each weapon card that's currently in stock. Now keep in mind, unless you're a master hunter with a search perk, only the exposed card or token in a face up stack is available for purchase. Now next up as a no grid action while in the town hall, you can buy the first player token. This is gonna be the hat token for the base game and the death helm marshal's badge for the upgraded version. When you buy this first player token, the token is flipped to the side displaying sold and the turn continues as normal. So once the night phase is completed, the player who purchased the token receives it, flips it back over to the normal side and starts the following day phases as the first player. If the first player sign is exposed, that token cannot be purchased. Lastly, if you enter the town hall while you meet any condition listed on an unclaimed honors token, you'll gain that token. Okay, so Gala Hall introduces a calendar resource seasons, buying your first player token and honest tokens. Next up, let's talk about the bank. As a no grid action, the Bank of Midland allows you to store your precious cash, earn interest, and even notoriety while doing so. Any cash in your savings cannot be looted if you lose the PvP fight. It's kept safe in the vault, but not for long. So to open a savings and receive a bank note card, you have to be in the bank, take a bank note card from the supply, and deposit any amount of money onto the card. Now, while it does cost no grit to interact with your bank note in any way, you have to be in the bank while doing so. If you deposit less than $5, place the silver dollars on the deposit here slot. This row is called change. Now, during the earning step of the night phase, each player with the bank note moves all their stacks of change to the right by one space. When a stack reaches month three, you move the stack back to the deposit here slot and add two more dollars to it. Once the stack is equal to or exceeds $5, you exchange $5 for a gold coin and place the gold coin on an unlocked spot on the bottom for mining and earn one notoriety point. Any excess cash would be returned to the deposit here slot. The amount of slots you have unlocked is equal to your mining level, which means that a novice miner can only have $5 and change on their banknote at any time. If at any point there isn't a notoriety slot available on your banknote, then your change stops progressing each night and you can't make any more deposits until a slot is made available. 
At any point during your turn, you can break one or more gold coins and choose the amount of money to withdraw. But once it's less than $5, the remaining amount goes back into the deposit here slot and you lose that notoriety. So if you wanna keep your money safe and earn some interest, you wanna to go to the Bank of Midland, deposit money there, and then it'll gain interest each night. There's another mechanic that Shadow Governors introduces and that is event cards. Shuffle the entire event deck and place it in the supply where it is easily accessible to all players. Anytime you travel between any two tiles, from town tile to terrain tile, from terrain to town, or from terrain to terrain, at the end of that movement action, draw and resolve an event card before continuing your turn. You are limited to drawing one event card per turn and it has to be after your first movement between tiles. If you're releasing to your cabin after losing all your vigor, do not draw an event card. First, check to see if the location icons on the top left corner matches your location. If none match, sweep that card to the bottom of the deck and do not draw any more events this turn. If it does match, then continue reading from left to right and top to bottom. The only exception is with locality cards, which are special universal cards that resolve regardless of your location. But we'll talk about those later. As you continue to read from left to right, look at the event number. If it's black, then the number is read aloud and another player immediately opens the standard field manual or SFM for short to the event references, which are on pages 20 through 21. Just make sure the player with the SFM does not read any of the results until the event is resolved. If the event has a red strike through, then it's not listed in the rulebook and there's no need to open the SFM. For both black numbers and slashed numbers, read the rest of the event card out loud, then follow the instructions listed on the card. Events with black numbers offer several options to choose from, so choose one, let the player with the SFM know the number of your choice, then they will read aloud the result for that number only. Be sure not to reveal any other results to the player interacting with the event. If the event you draw is a locality, then it is handled differently. So what is a locality? These are universal events that usually apply to all players and they don't happen right away. When you notice that the event is a locality, flip a calendar marker to the purple pin side, count the months ahead of the current date equal to the amount listed in the matching pin icon on the card, and then place that pin there. Now some localities do list a specific month, but that's only pinned if the month has yet to occur in that year. If it does occur next year, then the card is swept to the bottom of the deck. Once pinned, you'll immediately continue reading the card until you get to the purple text, then stop reading and place the card face down in the locality slot under the town hall. Once a month marker advances to the pinned month, return the purple pin to the supply and immediately finish reading the locality, then place it next to the tile that matches its location icon. Okay, if another locality is drawn while there's a pin already in the calendar, that card is swept to the bottom of the event deck and you don't draw another event for the rest of that turn. Only one locality can be active or pinned at any time. Our favorite way to play event cards is to read them aloud and even act them out. For most cards, you wanna to try to get in the mind of your character and think, what would they do in this situation? The last thing for you to know is that there are new ways for you to gain and also lose notoriety points. Purchasing legendary weapons, these are the ones with the purple background, will gain you one notoriety each and cannot be looted. If you ever decide to sell the legendary weapon or lose it for any other reason, you lose that notoriety that it comes with. If you master an endeavor, you gain a notoriety and level the skill listed on the card by one. Building cabins gain you one notoriety point per cabin built, but you may only build as many cabins as equal to your logging level. Keep in mind, if your cabin is ever burned down, it is returned to your player board and you lose that notoriety, but it can be built again. To start a fire anywhere, you must have a fire starter, which is a weapon that has the fire symbol in its special slot. You can exhaust that weapon by placing it on the table and turning it sideways. The person who started the fire is referred to as a fire raiser and is responsible for that particular fire. If starting a cabin fire, the range between the player mini and the cabin piece is calculated normally because the cabin piece is the target. Once the fire starter is exhausted, the fire raiser must attempt the malice check listed with the no grit burn cabin action on the cabin card. If successful, the fire raiser immediately places a fire token in one of the resource storage slots, which will destroy anything in that slot. If unsuccessful, the fire raiser does go to jail and their turn ends. Also, if a fire raiser loses all vigor while they have an active fire, the fire does remain, but they still go to jail for committing a crime. Anywhere there's a fire, any endeavors or restorative effects like healing vigor and willpower listed in that acre are canceled. 
If any player or NPC is in an acre where a fire token is placed there, they will take one damage. Keep in mind that there can only be one fire token in an acre at a time unless there are marked slots for fire tokens like on cabin cards. Fires will spread during the fire spread step and each of the fire raisers at the table with active fires choose only one of their fires, even if they have more than one, to grow by a single fire token. Now only during the fire spread step of the night phase, if a fire ever has no acre to spread to, then that entire fire is going to burn out. Or in the case of a cabin, it'll burn down and then that cabin gets removed from the board. When a cabin fire is burned down, the fire raiser will receive one notoriety point. As for the cabin's owner, the cabin and the cabin card are returned to their player board and they lose that notoriety gained from the cabin. A wildfire is then started in place of that cabin, so the fire raiser will immediately place one fire token where that cabin used to be. If any players are in the cabin when burned down, they will lose all vigor. So this brings us to two other types of fires, wildfires and town fires. While on any terrain tile, other than the mountains, you can exhaust a fire starter to start a wildfire and place a fire token directly into the acre that you're targeting. Once again, each acre can only have one fire token unless there are designated slots for the fire tokens. Each individual fire can only exist within a single line of sight. They can never spread from one colored acre to a different color. If a fire is started in a multicolored acre or a white colored acre like a cabin card, then the fire raiser must choose the color to which it will spread and it cannot change colors from there. Wildfires can spread into a white colored acre as long as it's adjacent to the fire's current color and fires can never spread into or out of a black colored acre. Only when the fire spread step of the night phase begins, if a wildfire ever has no acres to which it can spread, then again, it's going to be burned out and removed from the board. Now, as fires grow in size, so too does its fire intensity. Fire intensity is the rating given to every fire whether it's a cabin fire or a wildfire, that's equal to its current size. To calculate the fire intensity of any fire at any time, locate which of the fire tokens were first placed on the board and observe the difficulty of its skill check. Increase the skill check by plus one for each other fire token that's connected to the original token and within line of sight. The resulting number is the fire intensity for that specific fire. Now, the same way that cabins can burn down and start wildfires, wildfires can become strong enough to spread into cabins. First, that fire has to have one of its tokens in the same acre as the cabin. If the fire intensity of the adjacent fire ever equals or exceeds the mouse check listed on the cabin card at the beginning of the night phase, the fire raiser may then choose to add a token to the cabin card, thus starting a cabin fire as well. As long as you exhaust a fire starter and pass the mouse check listed for the no grit town fire action, you can start a fire within range of that weapon. Now this means that a player can exhaust a recurve and pass a mouse check to start a fire in this acre and at night that fire can spread to the saloon. If a store is on fire, then that store is closed and no one can interact with that store until the fire is burned out. Whenever you start your turn or move into an acre containing a fire token, you must interact with it, which is a no grit action, or you suffer one wound due to smoke inhalation. If you choose to douse the fire, you must attempt a mouse check equal to the fire's current intensity. If you pass it, you take out all that fire's tokens from the board, even the wildfire and the cabin fire tokens that the fire spread to. Although some items do display a douse icon, those items are not required to douse the fire and instead just buff your dousing rolls when exhausted. If you choose to navigate the fire, you must attempt an agility check equal to the fire's current intensity. If successful, you may move from one side of the fire to the other or anywhere in between. Lastly, if you choose to befriend the fire, you must attempt a persuasion check equal to the fire's current intensity. If successful, you calm its spirits and will receive no wounds from the fire until the beginning of your next turn. As shown on the fire tokens, if you are unsuccessful in any of these attempts, you receive one wound as a penalty. Lastly, abandoned cabins are public use cabins that are interacted with in the same way as any other cabin. During the game setup, place a black cabin piece on the board where the artwork displays a cabin. Then place an abandoned cabin card to the side of the terrain tile in line with the black cabin piece and place one chest token on each card. One thing to note, they are often guarded by gunmen. If you end your turn within the range listed on the gunman NPC token, they will attack you unless you pass the sneak check listed on their token at any time during your turn. The range applies even if they are outside the cabin and you are inside the cabin. Woo, fires, riders, saddles, and honors events, skill cards, banknotes, and to-do lists. In typical Bantam style, more and more possibilities are introduced with each new game mode. 
Enjoy your adventures with the Shadow Governor's game mode and be sure to play it a few times to really learn the rule set and to get a feel for how different each playthrough can truly be. Once you are well acquainted to the mechanics listed thus far, you can claim to be a true Shadow Governor. At that point, take time to appreciate how far you've come, but do not stop there. An even more thrilling and competitive adventure awaits. When you're ready for the final game mode, flip your terrain boards over to reveal the knight and embark on the ultimate journey, Masters of Chaos.